Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by Barry Gredenchik. Today we'll hear a testimony from the Department of Buildings, the Department of Housing Preservation, and the Department and Development, uh, tenant advocates, members of the real estate industry, business owners, and other interested members of the public on eight bills. Intro number 342, sponsored by Council Member Rolls, will require building owners to post a sign that a portable ramp is available for access to the building at inaccessible building entrances where such a ramp exists. Intro 353, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, will require DOB to allow users of its website to sign up to receive email updates whenever a change in status is recorded on certain construction projects filled, filed with the department. Intro 358, also sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, would require multiple dwelling buildings owners to post a color photograph of the designated building janitor in addition to the contact information they are already required to make available to all tenants. Intro number 585, sponsored by Council Member Williams, would require the owner of a multiple dwelling to include a statement as to whether or not such multiple dwelling contains any rent regulated apartments in their annual registration statement. It would also require such owners to post a sign in such multiple dwelling indicating that the multiple dwelling contains one or more rent regulated apartments. Intro number 780, sponsored by Council Member Rivera, makes several changes to Local Law 55 of 2018, including requiring landlords to, make, to take measures to eradicate pests and remediate the existence of indoor allergen hazards and allowing HPD to determine whether to perform the work to eradicate indoor allergen hazards. Intro 862, sponsored by Council Member Vallone, will require DOB to issue stop work orders whenever notice to revoke a work permit is given. Intro number 948, sponsored by Council Member Torres, will require HPD to identify Class A multiple dwellings in the city with the highest ratios of temperature violations to dwelling units. Those buildings would then be required to install temperature reporting devices for a period of no less than four years. Finally, intro number 979, sponsored by Council Member Richards, would specify the conditions under which HPD is required to enter into a regulatory agreement with a community land trust. Additionally, this bill also clarifies that HPD may renegotiate a 99-year ground lease agreement before the expiration of such ground lease and that the default for a regulatory agreement need not be 99 years. And our sponsors haven't arrived yet, so we'll move forward and hear testimony from the administration. You raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. I do. Thank you. You can begin, please. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Cornegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I am Anne Marie Santiago, Deputy Commissioner for Enforcement and Neighborhood Services at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I am joined today by Mario Ferrigno, Assistant Commissioner for Code Enforcement. I am pleased to be here today to testify on introductions 358, 780, 979, 585, and 948. I would like to begin by talking about the work HPD does around our city's heat laws. HPD's top priority is the health and safety of New York City tenants in their homes. As many of you know, last Monday, October 1st, was the first day of heat season, which will last until the end of May 2019. Building owners are legally required to provide heat and hot water to their tenants. During heat season, if the outside temperature falls below 55 degrees between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m., the inside temperature is required to be at least 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., the inside temperature is required to be at least 62 degrees Fahrenheit. HPD aggressively responds to heat complaints and violations. In heat season F, uh, fiscal year 18, HPD issued nearly 4,500 heat violations. We encourage all New York City residents living in homes that lack appropriate heat to first attempt to notify the building owner, managing agent, or superintendent. If heat is not restored, tenants should register an official complaint via 311, and an HPD inspector will be dispatched to the location if the tenant does not confirm that heat has been restored by phone. In order for HPD to issue a heat violation, an HPD inspector must conduct an inspection during which the inspector takes an outdoor temperature and an indoor temperature in a room unaffected by auxiliary heat. The inspector uses a thermometer certified for accuracy by the city. HPD issues violations when the temperature is not meeting the legally required threshold. 
and if the owner does not make the necessary repair, our emergency repair program may take appropriate action to restore service. The cost of the repair plus an administrative fee is billed to the owner through the Department of Finance. In fiscal year 18, HPD spent over $3.3 million and completed uh, 40, uh, 1,469 heat and hot, and hot water work orders. Working together with the City Council, we continue to seek ways to ensure owners provide adequate heat. Focusing on buildings which fail to provide heat on multiple occasions is the right direction. In 2011, the civil penalty structure was changed so that buildings which have multiple heat violations, which are subsequent violations at the same building that occurs within two consecutive heat seasons, can be penalized more severely than buildings that experience a single heat outage. Collections on heat and hot water violations over the past five years have totaled more than $8 million. In addition, HPD may impose an inspection fee of $200 if a third or subsequent inspection within a heat season results in a third or subsequent heat violation, and if a third or subsequent inspection within the calendar year results in a third or subsequent hot water violation. Both of these tools are being used by HPD to target and take action against properties which may have repeated heat outages. Since fiscal year 2013, HPD has billed over 1.3 million in heat and hot water inspection fees and recouped more than 80% of those fees, most of which were hot water. I will now turn to the legislation being considered here today and the bill specifically pertaining to heat. Intro 948, sponsored by Councilmember Torres, requires HPD to produce a list of 150 Class A multiple dwellings with a designated ratio of heat violations to dwelling units. These buildings will be required to install and maintain internet-capable temperature reporting devices in each living room of each dwelling unit in their building. While we appreciate and support the intent to add an additional tool for the city to be able to hold landlords accountable during heat season, we want to be clear that this requirement will not affect HPD enforcement. As I detailed previously, HPD inspectors must take the indoor temperature of the dwelling unit and determine whether or not to issue a violation based on that reading. We are continuing to look for ways to improve our response to ensure that HPD is responsive to the needs of tenants. For example, within the last heat season, we have started to ask tenants calling 311 to indicate if there are certain times in which the lack of heat is felt more ac uh, acutely, and we try to consider this information when dispatching an inspector. Tenants do not need to wait for an, uh, to wait for an automated system to advise that the temperature is below the required temperature to call 311. Although the system may provide useful data for a tenant who seeks to bring a tenant action, HPD litigation will rely on the inspections conducted by HPD to verify the existence of a condition. We always appreciate the Council's partnership in educating New Yorkers how to contact 311 and are happy to work with all of you to continue increasing awareness. We are open to discussing this legislation and other methods with the Council and the bill sponsor with an eye towards effectively enhancing our enforcement efforts. Last year, we partnered with Councilmember Torres to enact a groundbreaking new tool that uses sales transaction data to predict potential for tenant harassment. And we look forward to building on that template of collaboration and further efforts to legislate the use uh, the, of data in housing policy. Intro 585, sponsored by Councilmember Williams, requires owners of multiple dwellings that contain one or more units subject to rent regulation to post a sign that states that the building contains one or more units that are subject to rent regulation. The bill also requires owners to indicate the number of such rent regulated units when they register these properties with HPD. It is our understanding that the intent of Intro 585 is to inform tenants or prospective tenants of the possibility that their unit is rent regulated. The New York State Division of Housing and Community Renewal is the agency that is authorized and mandated to enforce rent regulations throughout the state, including in New York City. Because state law requires owners of residential units that are subject to rent regulation to file annual rent registrations with HCR, we would encourage the council to work with the state partners to discuss how HCR can be helpful in increasing awareness about the rent regulated status of buildings. We would welcome participation in that conversation and are happy to explore additional methods of educating tenants about rent regulations and their associated protections. Keeping tenants safe is not only about keeping them safe from maintenance conditions. Intro 358, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, seeks to improve tenant safety by requiring a picture of the janitor to be posted at the building. The Housing Maintenance Code currently requires landlords to post information about the name and contact number uh, for the building's janitor or janitorial service. HPD does not believe that this requirement will provide the, des uh, the desired security as owners may use the janitorial service or contract out for many repairs. We are happy to work with Council to educate tenants 
that they should direct any concerns about an individual's identity prior to entrance to their apartment, whether that person claims to be a janitor, other building staff, or contractors hired by the property owner to make repairs to the property's managing agent or building owner. Requiring the posting of pictures may also have privacy implications, which require further exploration. HPD strongly supports the other two bills pertaining to HPD being heard here today and appreciate the collaborative efforts with the council in making improvements and corrections to the legislation passed in 2017. HPD supports intro 780 sponsored by council member Rivera regarding clarifying responsibilities of owners and HPD to address indoor asthma allergen hazards as codified by chapter, uh, I'm sorry, by local law 55 of 2018. HPD also supports intro 878 sponsored by council member Richards regarding community land trusts as captured in uh, local law 67 of 2018. Again, thank you for your partnership in making these corrections. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on these bills. Um, I turn it over to the Department of Buildings for their testimony. Good morning, Chair Cornegie, members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I am Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the Buildings Department. I am pleased to be here to offer testimony on three of the bills before the committee this today, introductory numbers 342, 353, and 862. Introductory number 342 would require that a sign be posted at inaccessible building entrances indicating that a portable ramp is available when such a ramp exists. There are many circumstances where portable ramps would not meet legal requirements for providing accessibility to buildings. For example, the building code requires that all public entrances of new buildings be permanently accessible to persons with physical disabilities and that entrances of buildings be made accessible when they are renovated. The American with Disabilities Act provides that when certain areas of a building are renovated, a portion of the budget must be spent on making the path of travel to the renovated area, including the entrance to the building, accessible. The ADA also requires that places of public accommodation remove barriers to access even when no other renovations to such places are planned. While creating a permanent means of access to places of public accommodation should be the goal, when the requirements just described are not applicable, the department is supportive of any measure that would make it easier for persons with disabilities to access buildings. In the limited instances where portable ramps are permitted, any such portable ramp should be safe for the user and should allow for independent access where feasible. The department supports this bill and suggests this bill be amended to specify that the requirements of the bill only apply to buildings that are not otherwise required by the code or any other applicable law or rule to have accessible entrances. Introductory number 353 would require the department to allow users of its website to sign up to receive email updates whenever there is a change in, a, in status for a construction project filed with the department. New Yorkers live in a built environment which must be maintained, built, and sometimes rebuilt through construction work. Given the significant impact construction can have on New Yorkers, the department recognizes the importance of sharing information with the public. As such, the department has made enormous strides in, in improving the public's access to our data with the goal of every building construction project having clear and transparent status. Building on My Block, which is a searchable online database that is organized by Community Board for easy reference, provides information on all new buildings, major alterations, and full demolition applications filed with the department. Users can search by property address or Community Board to find major projects near them. The Building Information System, or BIS, or the DOB Now Public Portal, allows users to see the latest developments at construction sites of interest, including complaint, violation, application, and permit information. In accordance with the Open Data Law, we are also publishing daily updates to all job applications and permits on the New York City Open Data Portal, which allows users to access the latest status of any construction project or group of projects. Additionally, the department is for the first time publishing online data-driven tools that provide the public with a wealth of information, presented in a manner easy to understand, with much of it being sortable and updated in real time. Examples include a quarterly data-rich dashboard of all construction activity in every neighborhood throughout the city, a real-time interactive map of major construction projects throughout the city, an elevator report including data-driven maps and animated graphics showing the history, status, and vital statistics of the city's more than 84,000 elevator devices, a real-time interactive map showing the exact location of permitted sidewalk sheds throughout the city, reporting on the condition of facades of buildings throughout the city greater than six stories in height, 
and a monthly enforcement report, which details the actions the department has taken against bad actors in the construction industry. The capstone of our effort to improve transparency is through our implementation of DOB Now, an online filing platform the department is building that, when complete, will replace Biz. Not only can users access specific job application and permit information through the DOB Now public portal, but as we migrate services from Biz into DOB Now, we are also releasing the data onto the New York City Open Data Portal. DOB Now represents a massive streamlining of our existing processes, and it will allow for the tracking of every action the department takes, often in real time, including the ability to receive alerts. Alerts will be limited to the processes in the department's purview and include, could include the status of applications filed with the department, plan examination updates, and permit information. The department supports the intent of this legislation and is working towards implementa implementation in a manner that is keeping with our continued rollout of DOB Now and our broader information, information technology priorities. Finally, introductory number 862 would require the department to issue a stop work order along with a notice of intent to revoke a permit. The department has the ability to revoke any permit for failure to comply with the provisions of the construction code, zoning resolution, or any other applicable rule laws or rules. Before revoking a permit, the department must notify the permit holder of the reasons for the proposed revocation and inform the permit holder that they have a right to present to the department with information as to why the permit should not be revoked. Borough commissioners, who typically commence the permit revocation process, have the discretion to issue a stop work order based on the nature of the objections to the permit that has been issued. For example, a stop work order would accompany a notice of intent to revoke a permit if the safety of the public, workers, or property is in peril, or when the potential exists for construction work to occur in excess of what is permissible by law. In most cases, objections raised by the department are administrative in nature or easily correctable, and permit holders work with the department to address the basis for the proposed revocation and work can continue in a safe and compliant manner. If the basis for the proposed revocation is not addressed in a timely manner, a permit revocation letter is sent to the permit holder, among others, and such letter contains a stop work order. In 2017, the department issued nearly 1,000 notices of intent to revoke a permit and ultimately revoked 10% of such permits, which means that in most cases, permit holders work with the department to resolve all the department's objections. The law currently affords the department the appropriate discretion to determine when a stop work order should accompany a notice to intend to revoke a permit. Issuing stop work orders can result in undesirable outcomes, including prolonged disruption to the community through construction, worker furloughs, and lost financing. Additionally, issuing stop work orders with every notice of intent to revoke a permit would strain the department's resources. Before lifting a stop work order, a permit holder must prove to the department all the violating conditions have been corrected and an inspection must take place. As such, stop work orders should not be issued as a matter of course, but only when necessary to ensure safety and prevent work in excess of what the law allows. The department does not support this bill, as issuing stop, a stop work order with every letter of intent to revoke a permit could unnecessarily stop construction work that otherwise can continue in a safe and compliant manner. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify before you today, and I, of course, welcome any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. We've been joined uh, by Council Member Margaret Chin. Um, I'll begin with a series of questions. Uh, most of them are very simple and straightforward. Uh, and then I'll have my colleagues uh, chime in with any questions they may have. I'll start with um, intro 342 in relation to requiring a sign at accessible building entrances indicating that a portable ramp is available when such ramps exist. Um, the first question I have is, is there an amount of units that trigger the ADA law to be in place? Like, is it, is it four units and above? Is it three units and above? Do, do we know the answer to that? There is not. So the way the law works is basically, um, since the 2008 code went into effect, any new building that is constructed or any renovation of a building is required to be made accessible. In addition to that, those buildings that provide sort of public accommodation, places like movie theaters and such, they're required to be accessible as well. But there's nothing in the law that says, based on a number of units, that building needs to be made accessible. 
so I wonder how you, f what, the, what the general feeling on that is. So if there are smaller buildings, like in my district, there's three units and under that predominate the landscape. Um, and where land, where there, so, so there's a different requirement where landmarks are required. I understand that. Do you know the law? I'm not familiar with the law as it relates to landmarks, but concerning the type of building structure that you're mentioning, only if that building was constructed after 2008 or if that m building has undergone a renovation, that's the point in time at which the accessibility requirements kick in. And do you know what degree of, re re of renovations trigger that? So if the um, value of the work, the renovation work, is 50% or greater, that triggers that that building be made accessible. If it's less than 50%, then only those portions of the building that are being renovated, those portions require that they be made accessible. Okay, thank you, that clears that up. So the administration uh, supports 342? Correct. Um, does DOB keep track of buildings that have portable ramps? We do not, no. Does DOP track, keep track of buildings that have ex inaccessible building entrances? Uh, we do not, no. Does anybody, is, there, is that information gathered um, from any agency or do we know how we track that? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. So I mean, the, the law between, local law and federal law has established requirements in terms of what kinds of buildings can be accessible. For those buildings that are not captured under the law, they have the opportunity of installing a portable ramp. And this bill would require that in that event, signage be provided directing folks to where the ramp is, and you know, the department is supportive of that, of that proposal. And lastly on uh, 342, how many reasonable accommodation complaints have been made to the city due to a building or a public space being inaccessible to people with disabilities? I don't have that number handy, but I'm happy to check. But there is somewhere where that information is collected when someone makes a report, whether it's to 311 or whether it's to... We, Correct. We, we, it it we wouldn't be with that. the buildings department. I believe it's with the Commission on Human Rights, and I'm happy to look into that and provide it. Okay. That, that would make sense. If you could uh, coordinate an answer on behalf of human rights, if you guys could just, I would, I'm, I'm really curious as the chair uh, what, that no, what that number is. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Uh, any questions from my colleagues? Please. I do uh, want to ask um, the Deputy Commissioner um, a question. Uh, you take all the heat complaints in the city, is that correct? For privately owned houses. For privately owned. So if someone in NYCHA calls you, what happens then? The call gets diverted at 311 over to NYCHA. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. You're Chairman. Welcome. Thank you. Council Member Chair. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, intro A62 about stop work order. Uh, so in your testimony that in, in 2017 that the department issued nearly 1,000 notice of intent to revoke a permit, and, but ultimately only revoked 10% of such permits. How many of the stop work order um, was issued. Uh, so did you issue only stop work order um, to 10 percent, the 10 percent of the permit? Or was the number of stop work orders that were issued in 2017 related to those notice of intent to work was 14 percent. 14? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And ultimately of that full number, um, about 10 percent actually had the revocation of the permits. Okay, so this administration have suggestions about this bill, so you think that it should not be connected um, together, issuing the uh, revoke and, and stop work order? Oftentimes they are connected. I think how the department feels is the department should have the discretion as to, what, as to the point in time or whether to issue a stop work order or to actually go ahead and revoke the permits. When there's a safety issue, we issue a stop work order. When the plans that were previously approved by the department include a scope of work that's in excess of what the law requires, then we'll of course issue a stop work order. But many of the times, say when we audit applications that were professionally certified and we uncover objections, more often than not those objections are administrative in, in nature and the kinds of things that can be easily corrected and are actually not in violation of the law. 
And so therefore, we feel like a stop work order should not be issued in conjunction with that. So how many stop work order did you issue uh, in 2017? I don't unfortunately have a number of total stop work orders that we issued. It's a rather high number. But stop work orders issued in connection with these notices of intent to revoke, um, of the 967 that were issued in 2017, 14 of those accompanied a stop work order. OK. Also, would the uh, administration anticipate any additional costs if this bill uh, was to be enacted? Certainly, yes. Um, cost to the department, if we're issuing additional stop work orders, that would require resources from the department to follow up with inspections of those stop work orders. So that would certainly be a, a resource concern. And then, of course, there would be resource concerns that would be borne upon you know, owners and applicants themselves as well. As well. OK. Well, thank you. Very good, Chair. I just want to remind the public, if uh, you'd like to sign up to testify, the time is now. Please fill out a white card. I see that it's going around. Um, I'm going to uh, jump around just a little bit. Uh, intro 979 in relationship to community land trust. That's important for communities like mine who um, find themselves under the crunch of gentrification. Um, how many community land trusts are in New York City currently? Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague uh, who's in our Office of Development. Can you I just ask that you identify yourself when you, um, sure. before you testify. That's okay. Good morning, my name's- what? I'm sorry, we have to act actually swear you in as well. Oh, okay, excellent. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth and respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. My name's James Leva. Good morning. I work for HPD. I'm a director of disposition and have been involved with uh, Community Land Trust in capacity of being on our task force and also working on uh, varying Community Land Trust initiatives within the agency. Uh, so thank you. So the question was, uh, how many community land trusts are in New York City currently? There are, uh, I believe we're at two uh, established community land trusts today. There's Cooper Square uh, Community Land Trust, which is well established uh, and uh, has run a number of years. Just recently, Interboro uh, Community Land Trust incorporated this spring. There are uh, a couple of other uh, interested uh, nonprofits that are applying for their uh, certificate of incorporation. Uh, the second one, where is it located? Uh, it's a citywide community land trust. How does the citywide, it, how does the citywide work? Interboro Community Land Trust is uh, formed by four nonprofits, and these uh, nonprofits are, like I said, have incorporated, and they are in the process of establishing governance structure and the such. But I, I you know, they, they would have to ask, answer that question as to how they, you know, operate. Yeah, so I'd like to get their information because right, right, that's right. that's a very interesting yeah, concept, the, uh, a citywide community land trust. Um, have, city, have CLTs helped to preserve affordable housing, in your opinion? I, I you know, I, I think that I, I in, in regards to our opinion around community land trust, I think that we're in a spot where through, through the uh, funds that have been uh, provided to a number of community land trusts in the city, which was $1.65 million uh, just last year, we're actually exploring the value that they can be, uh, that they present to the city. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on how CLTs have managed the properties that they've been assigned? My thoughts on how they've, uh, I'm sorry, can you ask that again? Uh, your thoughts on how they've managed um, properties? I would, I'd be happy to get into like how uh, HPD uh, views the effectiveness uh, of community land trust, but in regards to this bill, I, I believe that it's a, a technical uh, amendment, and I'd rather, yeah, it's so, sorry about that pause. Uh, you know, the, the partnership that we have in place with Enterprise Community Partners, where we've actually uh, provided this funding to these varying community land trusts, it's affording us the opportunity to, to ascertain that very question. We, we're very interested in being able to measure the effectiveness as well. So quite frankly, I was cheating a little, trying not to have a whole hearing on CLT and get as much as I could right here. So um, we, can, we can circle back, because I'm not trying to put you on a skewer. Uh, at this point, but there are serious questions 
uh, like mm -hmm. communities of, uh, uh, of, of color and communities like the community I represent who are interested in the whole idea uh, and proposal of, of CLTs. So we can, we can revisit that. I'll, I'll let okay. you off the hook. Uh, <laughs> but we, we will be coming back uh, to talk with HPD about um, the Community Land Trust, not only because a considerable amount of funds have been allocated towards Absolutely. that, but it's a, it's a premise that, you know, obviously we believe as a council mm -hmm. uh, would, would be helpful in, in managing properties, um, you know, in, 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 uh, in extenuating circumstances. So, so thank you for your testimony. I appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Chen. Thank you, Chair. I, I don't want to let him get away. I do have a question about community land trust. And I think it really deserves another hearing because there's so much interest. Um, I guess relating uh, to this bill, but in my district, I have uh, property owners who want to preserve their building. They are providing affordable housing. I mean, these are uh, tenement building that's been around, a lot of them, uh, 100 years or more. And a lot of these buildings are not owned by individuals. They are either owned by what we call family association, um, based on the par part of China they're from or the last name. And a lot of these associations, uh, when they first started, uh, they were able to you know, bring everybody together and they chip in and they uh, bought building. So there's a certain a number of building um, in the community that they're not gonna sell these buildings. And, but they are also um, confronted with a lot of issues in terms of repair, uh, also high property tax. So we've been convening some of these groups to look at what can the government do to help them in terms of uh, supports for repair, upgrade a building, but also looking at this whole property tax issue. On one hand, they're providing affordable housing, but they're not, you know, they don't know how to navigate uh, the government system. And then also we have small property owner who are, who own building from their family, and they don't want to sell. But every day they get, you know, calls from a uh, speculator, oh, do you want to uh, sell your building? And they're like trying to buy their building for very low price. So they want to be able to band together. And so the idea of a community land trust uh, is something that we want to explore to see how we can pull all these buildings together uh, in a community and to be able to take advantage of program that the city offer and to be able to help them generate uh, needed revenue so they can continue to upgrade um, their building and so that it could last for the next hundred year. So that's why I think the whole concept of community land chart is something that we should really invest in and, and help a uh, different community uh, to explore this. I appreciate those comments, council member. I, I would agree that there, there's viability in exploring this concept and I'd be very happy and we would be very happy to engage in that conversation. Yeah, we also have been getting some help from uh, Cooper Square Committee mm -hmm. because of their positive model, what they were able to accomplish. And the difference is that a lot of their building um, were once owned by the city and they were able to um, convert them from till buildings into affordable HDFCs. And so it's the synergy is there to kind of pull them together. But the unique situation in my district and maybe in, in other district is that these are private property owners. But if they are not flipping their building, so there's got to be ways that we can look at how to help them preserve. I am looking at uh, legislation that can help some of these owner uh, defer property tax uh, so that they can use that revenue um, to upgrade their building and to preserve the affordable units that they have in there because they're not getting any kind of property tax relief and we have to find ways uh, to give them some of that relief so that they can upgrade their building and continue to provide affordable housing that we so desperately need in the city. So I would look forward to working with HPD and really explore this concept and see how we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thank you. So um, in regards to intro 780, in relation to clarifying responsibilities of owners in the Department of Housing and Preservation and development to address indoor asthma allergen hazards. Um, so obviously uh, there's a lot of issues around mold and, and indoor allergen hazard hazardous allergens. Um, does the administration support intro 780? Yes, we do. We worked uh, with the council member uh, uh, in the last session to get local law 55 passed and that was the primary bill. This is just technical amendments to that bill. Uh, thank you. Um, proposed intro 358A in relation to requiring a color photograph of desi designated building janitors in building and multiple dwellings. Does the administration support proposed intro 358A? Uh, we'd like to continue conversations with the, with the sponsor of that bill um, to make sure that we're understanding her purpose uh, and to see if there's another way. I, what we understand is that she's concerned about tenant safety as we are, and so we'd just like to speak with her further on, on the details of that bill. Um, how many violations has the city issued to property owners for not providing janitorial services? We issue violations for not providing janitorial services and then for not posting the information about janitorial services. Um, I believe we do have numbers from last fiscal year. Just give me one second. In fiscal year uh, 18, we issued 394 violations for failure to provide janitorial service, and we issued over 3,000 violations for uh, failing to post the signage. Thank you. Are you aware of any cases where a person impersonated a building's janitor for any reason? I'm not personally aware of that, sir. Thank you. Um, Intro 585, in, a, in relation to posting certain information to multiple dwellings con containing rent regulated units, Councilmember Williams' bill. Uh, does the administration support that bill? Um, we believe that, that more work should be done with HCR to improve tenants' knowledge about whether their building is rent regulated. Um, as you may know, we provide some information on our website about that if you go and you look up a building and our ABCs of Housing provides a lot of information to tenants on how to obtain that information directly from HCR. So they're, I take that to say that you have some concerns with the bill? They're the holders of the information. So the landlords are required to file rent regulation information with HCR, and it seems more appropriate to go to the source for that information. How does HPD collect information from HCR regarding units subject to rent regulation currently? So for enforcement purposes, we do not obtain that. For, I believe, for reporting purposes, there is an agreement with HCR about data, um, but there are you know, serious uh, um, limitations to the use of the data. Is that relationship in the form of an MOU? Um, I do not personally know. We can get back to you with that information. That, that's, that's important to know because uh, one of the things, I've been here five years, and, and time and time again, uh, interagency communication has come up over and over again. Now, I don't know whether or not interagency should be forced to use an MOU. It seems a little counterintuitive that that would be the case, but there has to be some way that there's a communication stream between related agencies mm -hmm. to, to, to get information. It's in, it's in constituents' best interest to do that. And I think, though, for this bill, the important communication is about the tenants knowing whether they are, they are rent regulated or not. Um, so that should really happen between the tenant and the agency that's responsible for maintaining that information. Okay, thank you. Um, almost lastly, um, so we had a, my, one of my colleagues asked a question about um, stop work orders or work permits, um, but I'm not sure whether or not the question as to whether or not you support uh, intro 862 was answered. So uh, 
The department does not support the bill as drafted because the department be believes it should have the discretion to determine when to issue the stop work order and should not be issuing a stop work order in every instance with the notice as a matter of course. But also back to the council member Chin's question about the number of stop work orders that the department's issued. Last year in 2017, the department issued 4,600 full stop work orders and that's on top of roughly 7,000 partial stop work orders. So under what circumstances would DOB issue a stop work order but not also revoke a job site's work permit? Because it seems, it seems that they would go hand in hand, right? To a novice like myself, it seems as though, yeah. you know, they, one would trigger another or at the very least they would go hand in hand. So uh, not in every instance, but in many of the instances, when we issue objections based on work, those objections are re relatively administrative in nature. So say, for example, it could be any number of things, but let's just say we reviewed plans and the plan showed that handrails were not included on the plans. In that instance, we issue an objection and give the applicant a period of time to respond to that information, that objection, and make that correction. We don't feel like in that instance, as in many others, it's an appropriate um, function to also stop the work. Only when there's a safety issue or only when that work that was previously approved is contrary to what the law allows that in that instance certainly would issue the stop work order, but in most instances, um, these objections do not rise to that level. We've been joined by my colleague uh, from the Bronx, Fernando, I mean, Pastor Fernando Cabrera. Um, you have any questions? Uh, so I want to thank you all for your testimony. Um, I look forward to continuing to work on the Community Land Trust uh, information as, as, um, as with my colleague, uh, Margaret Chin. Uh, we think that that's a very interesting prospect for particular communities, but for the city overall. So thank you so much, all of you, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I will call the first panel as they retire to their seats. Uh, Noel Francois, Anthony Drummond, Matthew Chacon, Shashir, I'm so sorry, and Frank Ritchie. Uh, good afternoon. You can begin in any particular order. I, as a gentleman, would say that we defer, but My name is Noelle Francois. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Housing Committee, especially Council Members Granegi, Williams, Espinal, and Rivera. I would also like to thank Council Member Richie Torres for sponsoring this legislation and Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams for his support of the bill, which is 948. Sorry. Uh, since our open data law became uh, was since our open data law was passed in 2010 and made 311 complaints available. Each year, there have been over 200,000 heat complaints made to 311 in New York City. During the winter months, heat is the number one complaint that comes into 311. Looking at the distribution of heating complaints across the city, we can clearly see that inadequate heat disproportionately impacts low-income New Yorkers living in gentrifying neighborhoods and neighborhoods that have historically faced disinvestment. Unlike other housing maintenance issues, a lack of heat isn't visible. It's not something you can take a photo of to prove it exists. This makes it uniquely difficult to prove. As we know, when someone calls 311 to report a heating outage, the complaint is put in a queue for an HPD inspection, and if the problem isn't resolved quickly, an HPD inspector will visit the home to investigate. Prior to visiting the home, however, HPD notifies the landlord that a complaint has been made. This gives good landlords the opportunity to fix the problem, but it also gives unscrupulous landlords a heads up that a complaint has been made and an, inspector will soon an inspection will soon happen. With that information, a landlord can simply turn up the heat until they are sure the inspection has happened, and then lower it again once they are sure they won't get caught. 
tenants with unscrupulous landlords can get stuck in this cycle for months or even years. Our current system was designed to give responsible landlords every opportunity to get back into compliance, and this is a good thing. However, it is not effective at holding bad landlords accountable. It is not designed to address the tactics of predatory landlords who have no desire to get back into compliance because they'd rather wait until all of their rent-stabilized tenants leave. At the end of the day, an underheated apartment isn't just unhealthy and uncomfortable, it's unlivable. And predatory landlords are withholding heat as a means of informal eviction. To them, the violations in housing court appearances are simply the cost of doing business. This is a harassment tactic we can put an end to right now using 21st century tools available to us. Continuous monitoring of the indoor temperature in the worst offender buildings is the way to do that. There is no reason why we should continue to guess what the temperature is or rely on he said, she said arguments or hope that an HPD inspector arrives at exactly the right time to perform an inspection and catch an outage. It's ineffective and not a particularly good use of resources. Intro 948 allows for a new tool, web-connected temperature sensors, so that we can monitor the temperature in known heat offender landlord's buildings 24-7. These are landlords who've already demonstrated bad behavior. Continuous monitoring gives tenants, lawyers, community advocates, and HPD the data they need to know exactly when the temperature, what the temperature is inside an apartment. With simple, low-cost technology, tenants, landlords, advocates, and city officials can view live temperature data for any apartment in the city that has a sensor in installed. There will be no more question as to what the temperature is inside the apartment, because everyone will know. HeatSeek is a nonprofit. My organization, HeatSeek, is a nonprofit civic technology organization and winner of the 2014 NYC Big Apps competition. We support New York City tenants whose landlords are not providing adequate heat in the wintertime by providing them with temperature sensors to document the temperature in their apartments over time. At HeatSeek, we take a number of steps to ensure the data coming from our sensors is accurate, reliable, and tamper-proof. Any sensor provider could easily replicate these measures when the this legislation takes effect. First, we use high-quality temperature sensors accurate to within plus or minus 5.5 degrees Celsius, same degree of accuracy as the thermometers used by HPD inspectors. When installing our sensors, we follow HP gu HPD guidelines for where to take a temperature reading, the coldest room in the house that is in a kitchen or a bathroom or a room with an obvious draft. We use tamper-proof tape to ensure the sensor isn't opened or removed from its original install location because the tape leaves a prominent residue if it is ripped off. Finally, we install sensors in more than one apartment throughout the building, so if any one of them starts producing questionable data, we can compare with the other sensors in the building. While we're not suggesting that everyone adopt HeatSeek's protocols, we do aim to demonstrate that there are effective steps that can be taken to ensure the data is accurate. HeatSeek data has been used successfully dozens of times over the past three years in landlord-tenant negotiations and in housing court. We've worked with attorneys at Legal Aid, Legal Services, the New York Legal Assistance Group, and others who've all used the data successfully when representing their clients. Inadequate heat is the number one problem facing New Yorkers in the wintertime and it is a solvable problem. We believe that web-connected temperature sensors and continuous monitoring are an effective way to hold bad landlords accountable and ensure that all New Yorkers have the safe, healthy, heated apartments our housing code requires. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Anthony Drummond from Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams' office. I'll be reading testimony on his behalf. Um, I want to thank the City Council, Chair Robert E. Cornegy Jr. of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, as well as Council Members Richie Torres, Jamani Williams, and Rafael Espina for advancing legislation, which was introduced on my behalf to allow for the deployment of heat sensors in certain buildings in New York City in this committee. I would also like to thank the committee for giving me the opportunity to provide comments at this public hearing. I am submitting testimony in support of intro 0948-2018 that will require the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development to identify multiple dwelling units with the highest ratio of temperature violations. It is time that we allow HPD to tackle 21st century problems with 21st century solutions. On December 1st, 2016, I was joined by tenants and housing lawyers in announcing a lawsuit based on data from an expanding technology partnership to monitor heating-related harassment in Brooklyn apartment buildings. The buildings where we announced this lawsuit, 178 Rockaway Parkway in Brownsville, 
was a property that has had 104 heat complaints through 311. My message to landlords across Brooklyn was that we're watching. Don't harm your tenants' quality of life all because of greed. Heat and harassment is an issue that affects our quality of life. Nobody in the borough of Brooklyn, let alone in the city of New York, should have to suffer during very cold winter months, I'm sorry, very cold winters with no intermediate heat. Bad acting landlords who continue to violate our community's trust by cutting off heat to drive out rent stabilized and rent controlled tenants deserve hefty fines if the condition isn't corrected. During the past two years, my office, in collaboration with locally based nonprofit Heat Seek NYC, a New York City Economic Development Corporation Big Apps winners, have been working with our housing court judges and local elected officials to help codify the city's ability to use remote temperature monitors to enforce heat standards. During the heating season, my office receives complaints about heat and hot water regularly. According to data from HPD, there were 117,767 heat-related inspections last heat season alone. Yet the same HPD inspectors only wrote 7,548 heat-related violations, a less than 6.5 percent enforcement rate that is clearly impacted by how HPD currently investigates heat and complaints. Currently, complaints are received by HPD who in turn alert landlords to the complaint and inform them that inspectors will be visiting the location to check heating levels. In essence, HPD is given a heads up to landlords who then bring heating levels up to legal limits in advance of the inspections. This situation is an unnecessary game of cat and mouse where the only losers are the tenants. The deployment of these temperature monitor devices will help us end this game of good by monitoring heat levels in real time and move New York City government towards a more dynamic future. I want to thank all the hard work and advocates like Heat Seek NYC, Legal Aid Society, and tenant organizers across New York City who have been at the forefront of this fight for improved quality of life of our rent stabilized and rent controlled tenants. We as policymakers need to empower them with the tools to partner with HPD and make their jobs just a little easier. I look forward to working with HPD to refine this legislation to ensure we can gather the best metrics to measure and plan for targeted deployment of these temperature monitoring devices. Thank you very much. I guess I'll go next. Uh, Frank Ricci, Director of Government Affairs at the Rent Stabilization Association. I'm here today to give testimony on two bills, Intro 948, which the two previous speakers spoke of, and Intro 780. We are opposed to both. I'm not going to read my testimony since you have it in front of you, but I will summarize both. On Intro 948, we actually agree with HPD on this bill that there are already a number of remedies available to the city and, and to uh, go after owners who don't provide heat. There's a Housing Litigation Bureau. There's the Emergency Repair Program. And of course, there is the Alternative Enforcement Program. Um, we think that the money that would be, have to be spent to put heat sensors in every apartment is a waste of money when that money could go back into the, the building and actually fix the system if it's old and decrepit. Um, I know that, that the, one of the previous speakers talked about how they're tamper-proof, but that doesn't preclude a tenant from ever opening a window and just getting the apartment cold. Um, we just think that the money is better spent giving the owner uh, the opportunity to fix it. Insofar as the comments made about uh, how HPD calls the owner first, a lot of tenants, when they don't have heat, don't call the owner first or call the super. They call HPD. So I think HPD years ago instituted this, this program of calling the owner to alert them because the owner is in the best position to fix the system. And yes, there are mechanical issues. They're, they're, things break. That's what happens when you have buildings where the average age is 75 years old. So yes, it's, it's okay for HPD to call the owner. Oftentimes an HPD inspector gets out there and the owner already has mechanics out there working on the system to fix it. So I think that's a good thing for tenants. You don't want them to go any longer than they have to without heat. And so far as intro 780 goes, we're opposed to that one. The law that uh, this would amend only went into effect in the past year. So there's absolutely no data whatsoever to suggest that the law is not working. But our problem with this is it puts absolute liability on an owner to correct conditions that maybe they have no power to correct. For instance, and I'm, I was surprised that HPD actually supported this bill, 
HPD has problems with access to apartments just like owners do. So if you have a tenant who's a hoarder, if you have a tenant who doesn't take their garbage out on a regular basis, and this is what's causing a problem in the building in terms of pests or rodents, which could lead to indoor allergens, the owner is oftentimes powerless to do anything about it unless there's a drawn out court situation. So I think leaving the words reasonable efforts in the bill and giving it some time to work and see, see if there's a problem with that is a prudent way to go at this point in time. Um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Shasher now. Thank you. My name is Matthew Shasher. I'm a uh, attorney at Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. I didn't come with any prepared remarks, but I'm here to speak about Intro 780. Um, and first, I want to correct a central point made by Mr. Ritchie. In fact, Local Law 55 has not been in effect for a year. By its very language, it goes into effect a year after its enactment. It became law in January of this year, so there is no data. Um, the language changes in that bill are in fact just mere technical corrections and uh, as someone who was in the room in the final negotiations for the bill, there were certain changes made in the bill um, as part of compromise between advocates and HPD that somehow didn't go into the final language and that's the extent of what these changes are um, and that was the uh, compromise made and it should be it should be enacted thank you thank you for your testimony uh, are there any questions from my colleagues oh we've been joined by uh, council member mark Jonah. thank you oh i'm sorry yeah just a quick question because i really don't know the answer to the question we're about to ask how much would it cost uh to have uh those sensors does anybody know in a building temperature? I think it depends on the sensor model, anywhere from, I think, 100 to 300 or $500. Uh, you don't need a sensor necessarily in every single apartment. You just need enough overlap to, to be able to see when there's sort of outliers in the data. So it wouldn't be in the entire, all of the apartments? Uh, I don't know what the bill requires, but I don't think so. It's, it's not necessary to put them in all the apartments necessarily. But how would they know if a particular apartment, maybe, maybe the heating is not getting there, air is stuck, how would, I mean. I would imagine when maybe you're asking for access to the apartments, you would ask the tenant if they've experienced trouble with their heat or you could look at who's made the 311 complaints. So where would the, sensors be at if it's not in all of the apartments, like in the hallways? I, I'm just trying to visualize this. No, they'd be inside the apartments, just you would choose, you know, some number of apartments or a percentage of the apartments to put them in. I think the bill requires they go in the living room. Okay. Frank, I think you wanted to say something. Um, yeah, I think if you read the bill, it says every apartment, that's number one. So at $300 a shot for, let's say, a 100-unit building, that's uh, quite a bit of money, and I think the money is much better spent uh, fi working on the system to make sure it's reliable. But it is in every apartment. That's what the bill says. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. So the next uh, panel consists of uh, Christina Pa. Uh, this will be our final panel, so if anyone has not signed up, please do so immediately. If you could just state your name for the record, probably pronounce way more correctly than I did. You actually did a great job. I'm Christine Appa. I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, where I work in the environmental justice program. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is a social justice organization, and we serve New Yorkers through three program areas, housing um, through, sorry, <laughs> through environmental justice, 
health justice, and disability justice. We are also members of the Asthma Free Housing Coalition, and we work to lobby to, for the passage of this law. I'm here to testify in support of Intro 780. We believe that the technical fixes are necessary to ensure that there's a clear understanding of the obligations of landlords before this law goes into effect. As my colleague, Mr. Shashir, mentioned, there were lots of negotiations towards the ending when they were about to get this law passed. And we believe that it provides a structure, <coughs> it provides enough information and enough clarity to ensure that landlords understand their obligations to tenants and tenants understand their rights. We're here just to say that we do support it and we've been looking forward to the implementation of this law for, for quite some time. And we're hopeful that having this in place, as I had previously practiced in housing court, there's often confusion about how um, mold abatement and the abatement of indoor allergens is supposed to go. And finally, New Yorkers will have a standard to look to. So we, we are testifying in support of this bill and we hope that it does in fact go into effect. Thank you. Uh, so did I understand it that your organization was also at the table during the negotiations for the bill? Um, personally, I wasn't, but my colleague, um, my program director, Rachel Spector, was also working on it. Okay. Thank you so much for your testimony. Yes. I just have a question, Chair. Um, on both of these bills, are we going to hold NYCHA accountable to the same standard? Is, are, they, are they carved out of these bills? Uh, so to answer that question, um, we've had uh, the, their, the, I don't think the bills as they stand include NYCHA, but I've had uh, ongoing dialogue with the chair, uh, Alika Samuels, about that, but I don't think the intent of the bill was to cover, the, as they stand, the bills as they stand, I don't think their intent was to cover. Uh, Chairman, can I uh, ask that we incorporate NYCHA residents into uh, both of these bills? So I will speak to both bill sponsors and make sure uh, that we can do that. But thank you for that suggestion. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Councilmember Williams is uh, joining us. Uh, we discussed your bill. If you'd like to, though, speak on your bill before we leave, that'd be great. As the sponsor of what number? 585. The, the bill sponsor 585 is here and willing to speak on the tenets of his bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, I know we're waiting on me to close out, so I'll just be brief. Uh, I think uh, 585, I like this whole package actually, 585 in particular. Uh, having been a, a tenant organizer, uh, going into buildings where uh, people had no idea that they were rent stabilized or what that meant. Um, I remember being in a meeting and someone asked, why don't we just post something? Uh, and another person said, oh, well, where were you when we were making the laws? <laughs> so uh, I decided to take that conversation and, do what I, and see what I can do about it by putting this bill in. Hopefully we can get it passed. I know the administration had some questions and concerns. I'd like to hopefully speak with them sooner than later so we can get this through. I think information uh, is particularly powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. This hearing is now adjourned.
test. Test, test. This is the Committee on Education. Today's date is October 16, 2018, and this recording is being recorded by Honda Utai.